absence of pride be, belong to those who are born to divine qualities. O oh, descendant of the light of wisdom, Arjun. Those are the attributes of those who are born to divine qualities. Hypocrisy, arrogance, self-conceit, anger, irritation, and even ignorance are the characteristics which belong to those born to the qualities of the forces of division. Mm -hmm. Now we've got the opposites, the forces of cohesion and union, emanating divinity, and we have the forces of division and individuality, striving for self-preservation. Divine qualities are for liberation, the qualities of the forces of division are for bondage, inevitably. Do not sorrow, son of she who excels Arjun, for you are born with divine qualities. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if you're sitting on a battlefield with me, conducting this discourse, there must be some good karma there. There are two kinds of beings in this world. The forces of divinity and the forces of division. The divine forces have been explained at length. Hear from me about the forces of division. Present. I gotta be me. <laughs> Men of the forces of division do not know actions of evolution or involution, nor neither purity nor good behavior nor truth. We only know what is convenient right now, in these circumstances, according to my present desire. They say the world is born from mutual union for the purpose of satisfying desires. There is no God, no truth, nor morality. Established in this view, these impure souls of little intellect become enemies of the world, performing fierce actions for destruction. Machiavelli. Perfect description of the political philosophy of the forces of division. Should a ruler be loved or should he be strong and feared? That was his debate. And he concluded, fear is the greater motivator than love. And therefore, he wrote a thesis based on fear. And his political thesis is still extant in the world today. Maintaining insatiable desires. Look at the palaces in Iraq and now in Syria, and oh, I mean all through the Middle East, insatiable desires. These were one of many palaces that these guys built while their people starved. Full of hypocrisy, pride and arrogance, accepting untruth and evil because of ignorance, they work with impure motives. Having immeasurable concerns which only end in dissolution, they take refuge in the enjoyment of desires as the highest and feel sure that is all. If I'm having a good time, the world must be at peace. That's the criteria. Bound by a net of hundreds of hopes, pursuing desire and anger, they strive for enjoyment of the objects of desire and by any inappropriate means to obtain their objectives. Today, this has been gained by me, and that desire will be mine in the future. Again, this wealth will belong to me. That's the thesis. That enemy has been slain by me, and I shall slay others in the future. I am a lord, the enjoyer, the perfect powerful, and I'm happy. I am wealthy, and I have a good birth. Who else is equal to me? I will perform religious sacrifices. I will be a giver, a donator, a benefactor, and I will rejoice. Thus deluded by ignorance, 
with many confused perceptions entangled in the traps of ignorance, able only to pursue the enjoyment of desires, they fall into an impure hell of confusion. They remain in that hell wherever they go. Whether they're trying to purchase greater enjoyment or they're just confused, they remain in that hell of confusion, not knowing peace and not knowing clarity. No matter how much we spend on objects of enjoyment, we know who we are in truth, and we remain in the hell of that confusion. I can't get it out of my mind that just because I purchased this or that, I'm the same. I didn't change myself. Filled with self-conceit, stubborn, intoxicated with the pride of wealth, ostentatiously they perform religious sacrifices in name without observing the ancient procedures. I'll just pay a pujari to do the puja for me, and I'll go there and give my darshan. <laughs> Taking refuge in egotism, strength, haughtiness, desires, and anger, these malicious people oppose me as the soul of all bodies. I throw those cruel enemies, lowest amongst men, in the ocean of objects and relationships for an eternity, in the impure wombs of the forces of division. Look around and we can see who is being born in the impure wombs of the forces of division. Or who is cultured, conditioned in a culture of division and saying our way is right and we, everyone who disagrees with us is an enemy. And if you injure one, you injure all of us. So therefore we are at war with all of you. Those deluded forces of division entering the womb in birth after birth do not attain me. O son of who takes away the deficiency of others, Arjun, even still they fall into a condition lower than that. The door to the hell of confusion where the soul is destroyed is of three parts. Desire, anger, and greed. Therefore, one should abandon these three. Mm. Mm. The man who is liberated from these three doors to darkness, O oh son of she who takes away the, the deficiency of others, Arjun, practices what is good for his own soul and goes to the supreme goal. He who neglects the procedures of the scriptures and acts to fulfill his desires does not attain perfection or pleasure or the supreme goal. Therefore, let the scriptures be your proof in determining the good effects and the bad effects from actions. And knowing what is said in the scriptures, you should perform action here. It the shura 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 diaya. Om sam sarasvati namaha. Namaste. Well, here Krishna is very clearly saying the scriptures can be your guide as to what constitutes harmonious behavior. If you have any doubt, just see what realized, enlightened, beautiful souls who merge with God. What did they do while they had a body? What were their actions like? How did they seek harmony? What was their definition of success? What was their understanding of wealth? What was the use of that wealth when they attained it? Did they go out and hire a, 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 a big feasts and, and a, 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 give themselves over to intoxication and to lust and, and uh, fornication? Or did they go and use that wealth to uplift humanity and strive for the benefit of their societies. What was the wealth that they had chosen? Let the scriptures be your guide if you have any confusion. And if you don't 
allow that to be your criteria, you will reside in the confusion of hell for from birth to birth to birth. I'm sure many of you have listened to the debate of where, what restaurant shall we go to to eat tonight? <laughs> I mean, we're confused. We want to go out and enjoy ourselves. Shall we go to this restaurant or shall we go to that restaurant? Shall we go to this hotel or that hotel? Which movie shall we see today? And the debate is incessant. It goes on and on and on. We are confused and burdened by how we shall fulfill our endless desires. And maybe if we go to this restaurant tonight, we can try that one tomorrow night. <laughs> There's always a next time. And look at the frivolous trivia of which to which we devote our attentiveness. And think. What significance does that have in the lives of enlightened souls who carry themselves like a great ascetic, who carry themselves as a renunciate, who take joy and delight in the upliftment of others, in empowering others, in sharing that bhavana, that feeling, that attitude with others. That is their greatest delight. They are free from confusion. What shall we talk about tonight? Not which restaurant we should eat in. Not which movie we should go to visit or watch. We want to talk about what was the criteria that enlightened leaders used to demonstrate to their followers what is the path of harmony? What will set us free? What will empower us to become better than we are? Certainly whether you go to this restaurant or that restaurant will not. It won't change our lives in the least. But if we understand one chapter, one verse, one word, one syllable of the Bhagavad Gita, it's going to change our lives significantly. And that change is going to bring about a new concept of wealth in the gross body, in the subtle body, in the causal body. It's going to bring us to a new perception. How do, I, how do I discriminate which desires that come to me? When I associate with beings, I'm going to assume their attitude. With anybody I associate, I'm going uh, always, it's the law of nature when the wind blows across a pond, then the wind gets cool and the pond makes ripples. And each, it's the law of mutual conductibility. Each quality is conducted to the, the dominant qualities of each partner in every partnership will be conducted to the other partner. So the wind and the water have a partnership. And the wind makes the, the water move. And the water makes the wind cool. And in the same way, we come into contact with the great saint and she makes us strive for greater understanding and for purity and clarity in our actions and for a decisive determination of what is our goal, what is our luxe, what is our sankalpa, what is our path, what is our process. She makes us decide and define and de determine how we propose to go, where we're going and what we're going to find when we get there. And when we go out and be with worldly people, we will listen to the debate of which restaurant shall we eat in tonight? Or which movie shall we go to see? How shall we define our forms of enjoyment from, through which we will escape from these minds and these thoughts that we're not enjoying right now, so we're going to go out and buy some greater pleasure, so we will enjoy our thoughts for a moment or two. Now, when we are confronted with these decisions, which path do we want to take? Which has greater weight? Which will have greater influence in the direction of our lives? My vote is for the company of sadhus and saints. Because in climbing up the mountain to sit with sadhus and saints, I am freed from the confusions of hell where I have to determine what I'm going to eat in that restaurant where I can't eat anything anyway. It all has onions and garlic. It all has some kind of beef flavoring. It all has something 
illegal or it fattening. <laughs> Either way, I am not the winner. I have greater benefit to have satsang with Srima and eat her lasagna, which is absolutely delicious. We know that. She got up this morning and started preparing for everyone who was going to come to the ashram this week. A whole host of menus. And she'll portion it out accordingly over the weekend. She demonstrated in her behavior what is her goal, what is her attachment, what is her perception, what is her criteria. She demonstrated it. She doesn't have to talk about it. I have to talk about it. I don't do anything. I'm just a lazy boy. Remember, some people are good for some things. Other people are good for other things. Sadhus are good for nothing. That nothing has big meaning. <laughs> Fat. Fat is a good meaning. All right, let's see if there are any questions tonight. We have a question from Sadhana Shakti in Seattle. Namaste Sadhana Shakti, Namaste Bibek. Namaste Sriman Swamiji. In verse 1 it talks about performing sacred fire ceremonies. If we are not able to perform the external fire ceremonies, how can we perform the ceremony on the inside? Well, in the Agni Chakra, in your third eye, there is a, there is a flame burning. And that yagya comes from the root yuj. It's the same root as yoga. So it means union. The union with the internal flame, with the external flame, is the yagya. We enkindle the outside fire and we see how bright is my inner fire. Now, if you cannot enkindle the outside fire, then do the entire yagya to the inside fire. This is one of the great meditations. Remember the shabda, pumsh, and manas are the three forms of pronunciation. Shabda means verbally, audibly. We externally express in an audible form in the gross body of sound which is heard by the ear. Pumsh. That feels so good. And manas. Sadhana Shakti, if you cannot enkindle the external fire, which today even I cannot do, this COPD has kicked me out of the fireplace. But they didn't stop this fire. So they are allowing me to enkindle the internal fire. And if you don't know all the mantras, then look at the book and mouth the words. And if you know them all, then close your eyes and watch the entire yagya take place inside the Agnya Chakra. Perform the Manas Puja and you will find even greater fulfillment than having performed the external yagya. I have a question. Krishna seems to uphold the forces of unity and the people who, ex who express that yes. as superior to the forces of division and people who express that. So isn't that right there a division? Yes. Yes. Is that a good division? Yes. It's a, there is a good division. There, I mean, there is, in duality, there's division. Whoa! <laughs> in unity, there's no division. When you have duality, there is division. If you have Purush and Prakriti, you have division. Now, amongst Prakriti, that's the nature, you have good natures and you have bad natures. And the good natures are a division. Now, take your choice. Which ones would you rather hang with? Who do you 
want to be a come-like. You're going to assume the qualities of the people that you surround yourself with. There's no question. If you hang out with drinkers, you'll be a drinker. If you hang out with dopers, you'll be a doper. If you hang out with the intellectuals, you'll be a great student. If you hang out with sadhus, you'll think about God. It's just natural. You're going to be conducted just like the water assumes the quality of the wind. You will become like the people you associate with. And I think that means it is incumbent upon all of us to be extremely judicious about the company that we keep. Because there is a very good possibility I'm going to become like them. In fact, there is a probability that I'm going to become like the people I associate with the most. And when I understand that, and I know it, and I feel it, and I know I'm not strong enough to change the world, well, I better go through the world with a lot of discrimination and see which people conform to my criteria of what is important and they share my values and then I'll become like them. That would be the best. I'm going to become like the people I associate with. I better choose the best or I'm going to become like the other people that are mediocre or worse. And who wants that when the choice is given to me? We are empowered to make the decision ourselves. So Krishna is saying, yeah, there is duality in the world. And if there's duality, there's opposites. And if there are opposites, there's good and there's bad. And now take a choice. Which would you prefer? We understand by your behavior. You don't have to tell me the decision. The very fact that you choose to not go to the disco, to come up here to the temple, that is a choice. You've just made your statement by your behavior. The very fact that you are acting in this way demonstrates the sincerity of your choice. Well, others who are at the disco tonight, or they're at happy hour at TGIF. Oh, no, today's Thursday. Sorry, I missed it. Uh, it wherever, I, they're, they're demonstrating their choice. Because they could be sitting like the rest of you in front of a computer screen, listening to some ranting swami sitting in a mountaintop in Napa, California. Well, those are the choices we'll make. Each of us makes that choice. Yes, there is duality. Krishna lives in duality. Krishna lives with Radha. Yes, please. I've heard you explain there a difference between discrimination and discernment. Um, I think it was one of the Bhagavad Gita's of the past classes that you took. Um, you said something along the lines of discrimination being a, a, a black and white kind of do or don't and a, and a discernment as, um, as selecting from a, 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 an, a, a selecting from some options that you have. With Show them. me the text if you're going to quote me. Otherwise, ask you the question without quoting me. What is the difference between discrimination and discernment? Yeah. Not much. Not much. Discrimination, I have a set of criteria, and discernment, I decide which fits this criteria, which fits that criteria. They work together. Uh, there's an adjudication in discernment, and in discrimination, I am applying a filter which, which sets up the criteria, how does it conform? So discernment tells me, how does the, do the, the categories of my discrimination conform to the criteria which I've established? And that, that, but you, you, you're chopping logic with logicians. Don't have to go there. Well, I guess my question arises from the idea that sometimes when we go out and decide whether we want to go to see this movie or that movie, there's movies out there that are really inspiring. Absolutely they are. And so, you know, it seems like there's discrimination sometimes to take it, to go to a movie. And, uh, you know, and it was a good idea to do that. And, Maybe. Um, Maybe. I'm not saying all movies are bad. I am asking you. 
which will give you the greater empowerment, which will give you the greater vision of the future, which will you give you the greatest inspiration in order for you to overcome the obstacles that are precluding you from reaching your goal. Now that will be your discrimination. That's the filter which you want to show in front of all the different desires that come to you. Where will the fulfillment of this desire take me and where will the fulfillment of that desire take me? The world is not bad, only we have to make discrimination. Thank you, Mother. Huh. She's got it. I can go on all night. She's got one sentence and she answers the question. Yes, please, Daniel. If, so if we find ourselves in a life full of debates about what movie to see or what restaurant to attend, with you know people for whom that's an important choice, how should how should we act so that we're you know uplifting them and, and ourselves on a daily basis? Well, first of all, we'll understand what what do we want to get from this association? What is our goal? What is our objective? And if our objective is to harmonize with that association, then we let them make the decision and go ahead. We won't put too much mind into such decisions unless we are stuck picking up the tab. If we have to pick up pay the bill, then probably we'll say, well, let's go to the, the hamburger stand instead of going to the, uh, to the fancy French restaurant. Otherwise, uh, let, let go with the flow and don't engage in the debate because it, that's not your primary concern. Your objective lies elsewhere. You know that you have certain associations which are going to carry you into a spiritual direction and certain associations which are going to work together to fulfill all of your material goals. You, there's nothing wrong with that. No, uh, no objection, and I wouldn't uh, uh, criticize the, those who are going to take you out to dinner because they're taking you to a nice restaurant. That, that's not what we want to do. We want to say, where do we want to go when we are given our choice? Now, if it's part of the job, push bump, to get in the corporate jet and fly around the world and uh, stay in, in fancy places, then it's part of the job. You do your job, and when you're off duty, you come to the Devi Mandir Namaste. When you're on, on Wall Street or any street, it, you're going to do the job. And when you get a day off, you come to the Devi Mandir. <laughs> Easy. It doesn't have to be a, trauma, a traumatic decision. If it's part of the job, then you do the job. And think. What do I need to save in order to stop doing the job? I am working this job towards a number of objectives. I need a certain amount of material security for myself, for my family, for my community, for my spirituality. Can you put a number on it? And when you get to that number, can you say, okay, I don't need any more? I don't have to go to the restaurant with people I don't like, to eat food I don't like, to listen to conversation I don't like, in order to keep the job I don't like. At some point in time, we reach the sophistication where we say, I've done it. I've got a t-shirt. I've been there. I've done that. And then we can stop doing those actions and say, gee, you know, there are other people who really would love to have a job like this and go to the fancy restaurant, talk to the people they don't like about things they don't like, and so they can keep the job they don't like. And I'm going to train my successor and... Namaste. <laughs> Possibly, you'll set goals for yourself, Daniel, all the way through and make a plan, make a master plan, and see how close you can come to making your ideal manifest. You know without a doubt that nobody plans to fail. But a lot of people fail to plan. The goal is to make a plan, even if, it's, uh, if, if you can't achieve it, you, you've got a direction, you've got a goal, you've got some criteria by which to discriminate. You know where you're trying to get to, otherwise, I don't know where I'm trying to go, how can I go? 
I can go to the bus station and say, I'd like to buy a bus ticket. And the first thing they're going to ask me is, where to? And if I don't have the answer on the tip of my tongue, they'll say, go to the back of the line. And when you know where you want to go, come on up and give me your money. I'll give you the ticket. So nobody plans to fail. We merely play, fail to plan, and if we make a plan, even though we're coming closer and closer and closer and not getting exactly to the plan, but we've got a direction, we've got an objective, we've got a target, we've got luxury, we've got a goal, a definition, what is my life about? And once you make that plan, you can see how you can harmonize all the different aspects of your plan into the master plan. Because you are not one-dimensional. You're not only your work, or only your education, or only your family, or only your love, or only your sports, or only your exercise, or only the food you eat, or only the movies you see, or only the... You're not... You're all. There's a spiritual Daniel and a working Daniel and a creative Daniel and an athletic Daniel and there, there are so many hats that you wear. How do we outfit you so that we can combine all the desires and all the different attitudes and attributes which you exhibit into a master plan that you can aim towards and say, this constitutes my earnout. This is my retirement. And this is what it's going to look like when I stop working for money and start working to empower people so that they can fulfill their goals, their dreams. You, you'll design it your own way. We designed ours our way. We started with a, with a mountaintop and we said, this is what it's going to look like. And we got on top of the bulldozer and looked at it and said, whoa, we put a road here, we put a pad there, we put, a, we put the temple over there, we put a house over here, put Shiva down there, we put, and we started making the plan of what we were going to do. We were going to write books and make CDs and make videos and teach classes on the internet. This was before there was an internet. So we, we made our plan and thank God. We stuck to the plan, and step by step, we were able to make it manifest so that we get to share with you today in order to empower the next generation to make your plans. And it's not just a one-dimensional plan. How much money do I need to earn out? No, it's what do I want to do with that money when I have it? What kind, do I want to live in, a, in a, an urban penthouse? Or do I want to live in a rural mountaintop? Do I want to drive a BMW or would I like to drive a pickup truck? Do I want to work with five computer screens or do I want to work with a pick and a shovel? Do I want to work with my hands or do I want to work with my feet? Do I, what, what do I want to do with my life? How do I want to make my contribution on every level? We want to make a vision. Make a plan, make a dream, write down your dream, write down your vision, write down the quest, and then flesh it out. Give it bones and skin and muscles and let it grow and expand and evolve. How do you want to make your contribution to this world? The main question again and again. Your contribution is not only financial. I gave it the office. That's not the kind of giving that we're talking about. The giving is what does your soul wish to contribute to this universe? Eternally. Please. What, what do you mean by give eternally? Give eternally. I would like to give something to this universe that stays around for a while. I don't want to give just a widget or a widget that's going to be destroyed the next time the wind blows. I want to give something that's going to survive me. Everywhere we poured a cement foundation, we took a stack of books and wrapped them in a time capsule and we wrote a letter and then we dug a hole 
underneath the foundation and then we poured all the cement of the foundations and the pads and the slabs over this so that this is a time capsule preserved and the letter which was enclosed within said we are building an ashram dedicated to our love of God. And these books are the basis. They contain the wisdom, the knowledge, and the inspiration with which we have become inspired to build this ashram. That's why we are doing it. So we are requesting anybody who excavates this site in how many years from now, if you find these books, please read them. They're in numbers of languages you won't have difficulty. Read them and see, at least get an idea of why it was we did the effort that we did in order to empower the next generations. Please, study the Bhagavad Gita and study the Chandipa and study the Vedas and study all the books to which we have dedicated ourselves. And we are doing it again by making our library of resources available on the internet. That's something that's going to be an eternal contribution, I hope. At least one person will say it's worthwhile. And in a thousand years, if one person says that was worthwhile, I would say, wow, we did a hell of a job, Mom. <laughs> that was quite a contribution. We did something. It, it outlasted us. I didn't just build a building which will be knocked down when I die. I didn't just build a mausoleum and say, here lies Swami. I, I built a monument to the love of my life, Saraswati, to knowledge. And I put it in books and I put it in apps and I put it in tapes and I put it in videos and we put it on CDs and we put it on DVDs and we put it on the internet and we put it in every media form possible so that we could pass it on to the next generations. Think of something eternal that you want to contribute and contribute that. Don't just bake a pie. You bake a pie and everybody eats and says, wow, wasn't Shivani great? She made a pie. Make something that's going to last for a thousand years. That's my request to all of you. Make something that's going to last for a thousand years. I am making qualified teachers to go out and share the dollar to go out and demonstrate the highest ideals of perfection. You guys are my ticket to immortality. The ones who will take over after we leave. You are our passport to freedom. And unfortunately, we can't go until you qualify yourselves. But as soon as you're qualified, we can go. And that's just what we're trying to do to empower you to digest this knowledge, to observe this knowledge, to feel this knowledge, to live with this knowledge, and really believe it. And then be qualified to pass it on to the next generation. And we will do whatever we can do to empower you to do that. If it means being good doctors and jumping on your chest and opening your mouths and shoveling the medicine down your throat, we will do that. Because we really sincerely want that you will want to take the whole enchilada, not just a portion of it, and say, oh, that's enough for me. Take the whole thing, the whole bhavana, the whole nine yards. You've got the knowledge and you've got the feeling and you've got the understanding. You've got the bhavana. You've got the attitude with a capital A. And it becomes your lives. Hopefully, that's our goal. And we hope we will succeed. Are there other questions? Question from Elijah in Seattle. Namaste, Elijah. Pranaman Swamiji, are the three parts of the door to the hell of confusion related to the three gunas in any way? Yes, they are. Completely.
and the, all the threes, the Kam Kala, Elijah, all the threes, the, uh, the gross body, the subtle body, and the causal body, the Auma, the Aim Ring Kling, the Satarajantama, these are the three doors uh, the, that bind us, and these are the three doors which will set us free. Once you enter through those three doors, you have the keys to understanding which door do, do I want to use all the time. I bet you you've got a number of doors in your house, Elijah. You've got a front door, you've got a back door, you've got a side door, you've got a garage door, you've got, you've got many doors. You've got a patio door, you've got a, a bathroom door. Which ones do you use the most? The ones that take you where you want to go. And I'd like you to study these three doors and see which ones you want to use the most. Satarajatam. Where do you want to go? That's the decision. We are only empowering you to make the decision. Question from Ambika in Princeton. Namaste Ambika. Namaste Sham. Namaste Sriman Swamiji. What do we do when we encounter people who have such strong religious beliefs that they can only see one way, their way, and if we do not agree with them, they consider us evil and going to hell? Well, you understand where they're coming from, and with compassion as a chaplain of the universal faith, you will allow them their opinion as you will understand that they won't allow you yours. And therefore, you have no reason to confront them and no reason to con con have confrontation or to have conflict with them. There is no use in debating with someone who won't let you speak. I mean, it's not a debate. If you want to listen to their lecture and their diatribe over and over again, then after a while, you'll just tune it out. But there's no reason we had in an earlier chapter, don't try to convince the person who doesn't want to understand. Don't waste your time. Ambika, you just share your light and share your love and let them blabber on and walk away as soon as you possibly can. You have nothing to prove to them. You have nothing to convince them of. There is no necessity to, to show them the error of their ways. Ambika, you just be the mother of the universe. You just radiate your love and walk out of that room. As quickly as possible, exit. There's no need to maintain such an association unless there's a need to maintain such an association. And if there is a need, then fulfill the need and leave. No, no reason to stay any longer than is necessary. You have a universal perspective. You speak many languages. You speak in many cultures. You speak in many ideals. You are an educated woman. And if somebody is, is caught and trapped in the dogma of their lack of understanding, leave them out. You're not sent to rescue them. You're sent to administer and to... to be the chaplain of those who hunger for your spiritual truth. Oh, don't waste your time uh, spreading pearls amongst the swine. Yes, please. Um, in verse 4, it speaks about division. How can we remove these qualities from within ourselves? Sri, the, our, the most important uh, concept is uh, who am I? What kind of individual am I? Am I a citizen of the universe? Am I a citizen of the world? Am I a, a, a belong to the religion of all human beings? Do I believe in one God who is the God of us all? If so, then all the divisions are they are extra, you extricate yourself from all division immediately, just by establishing your criteria. All you have to do is establish what are your values, what is important to you. And immediately you extricate yourself from all divisions. Look, I've been around the world more times than people have been to San Francisco. I speak more languages than the, guy, than the plumber who's working on the faucet does. Present companies, etc. 
I understand. I have more understanding and have read more scriptures from more traditions and more customs from more heritages. Than, so why shall I believe a myopic view to be the only right view? Only chant Hare Krishna and you will be saved? I have the Rig Vedic here. It has 15,792 verses. And you're telling me your mantra is the only one that's right? I believe in the universality of, of, of truth. So why can I, how can I bind myself to a myopic view of the world where you have only one dogma which is true? That's how you erase all the divisions. Just make yourself a citizen of the universe. This isn't the only place where, where life exists. I mean, there are people in China and they don't speak the same language as me. Are they all doomed? Or there are people on the other side of the earth or people in this country or that country or on other galaxies or other planets. Or on, and Mother loves to go to Mars. <laughs> Even though men are from Mars and women are from Venus, mother loves Mars. <laughs> uh, so it, with these ideals, you, you'll be able to get yourself into the mindset of a citizen of the universe. And then you erase all the divisions. And your job is to build bridges everywhere you find a division. You have a certain criteria for going into that circumstance. For example, you, you go to get a permit to do something from the city or the county. Huh. And it, it, you're not there to debate religion. You're not there to convert anybody or to convince anybody of anything. All you want is your permit. Go to the world and get what you need from the world and get back to your own world, which is unlimited and universal in scope. Take what you need from the world. Give what you can to the world. Be an example of someone who's shining in every circumstance and get the work done. And come home and be in your own space where it's okay not to have any barriers, boundaries, divisions. And then you can live without divisions. Yes, please? Question from Julia in San Diego. Namaste, Julia Ma. Become like the people we associate with, but still, in order to tear down walls, bring people together in peace, and see ma and all, don't we need to do a certain amount of associating with non-sadhus, yet do it with little attachment? Yes, we do, but how much do you, we need to do? This is the question that each of us will answer for ourselves, and it, it, it's in a state of flux. It's flowing, om, ang, ring, kling, chum, daki, bache. It's constantly flowing and constantly changing, Julia. So that, yes, we do need to associate with the world. We were talking the other night, I cannot feed myself by myself. I am not capable of putting food on the table without a cultivator, an agriculturalist, a machinist, a, a tractor maker, a tractor driver, a, a, a truck driver, a, someone to pick the fruit, someone to distribute the fruit, someone to market the fruit, someone to go to the market and pick it up and bring it home for me. I need a whole team of people to do everything I do. Whatever I do, I want to do with the greatest love, with the greatest generosity, with the greatest pleasure with the greatest joy, with the greatest sense of surrender and non-attachment so that I can tear down the walls. So yes, there are certain relationships that we must cultivate in order to subsist in this world. And in order to enhance that subsistence, we want to tear down the walls. But we don't want to go out and look for people, oh, you got a wall, I'm going to tear it down. No. In the course of our everyday business, we will build bridges to everyone. To the checker in the grocery store, and to the taxi driver, and to the police person, and the, the person who, who's writing the parking ticket, hopefully not on your car. Every one of them will just become the recipient of our love. Just like when Ma goes to San Francisco. It's like Satya Yuga going to the Kali Yuga. 
And everyone in San Francisco is running around with detachment and desire. And here comes Sriman. Everyone on the sidewalk stops and says, oh, what a beautiful sari you're wearing. <laughs> what lovely colors. What a breath of fresh air. What joy your, your, your demeanor exhibits. Just for no reason at all, they stop. And they say, oh, it's just so much peace and so much love. And she tears down barriers without saying a word. She may reach into her bag and say, oh, have a piece of chocolate. <laughs> or she may just smile and move on. In any way, Julia, she's tearing down barriers without having to pick a fight. She is her own excavation company. Question from Ramya in Bangalore. Namaste, Rami, Mommy. Namaste, Sri Baba. Is Sattva Goon only good and both Rajas and Thomas bad? Is our goal always to be in Sattva? No. No, absolutely not, Rami. Uh, the, all three Goons are good depending on your point of view. What are you looking at? Uh, if we say that sattva is being and rajas is becoming and tamas is rest, well, without rest, how can we have rejuvenation? Where do you get your energy from? From where does come the energy with which you will be empowered to become something different? You need that rest and you need that rejuvenation. So you need a little darkness so you can close your eyes. Then you get some sleep. At least some of you do. You don't all stay up all night emailing me. Some of you get to close your eyes and go to sleep. Not you. And not you. And probably not you. <laughs> but many of you do. You do use that darkness of, for rest and rejuvenation. So Rami, it's not only important to stay in sattva, but to stay in the mind of sattva and in the body of Raja, uh, 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 in the body of Thomas, where I am not the doer. I am merely the witness. Remember, Tamaguna is Gan Shakti. So the energy of wisdom comes through the Thomas, comes through the darkness. You can only see the light when there's darkness. You would never know that there was light if there were no darkness. So you can only see light if there is darkness. Darkness exposes the light. That's the theory of Ratri Shukta. Ushari Devayatatha. Ushama, Namaste. You illuminate the darkness. She brings her sister, Usha, and she illuminates the darkness, and Ratri departs. The night goes away. And the sun comes up and wakes up all of creation to productivity, to becoming more than it was while it was in rest. So all three of those qualities are necessary. Now, where do you want your mind to stay? Well, I know where your mind stays. You are Miss Sattva, and we're missing you. So anytime you can convince your husband to leave India and come back here, we will be very, very happy if you come back to the Devi Mandir or bring him along with you. I'll be very happy to. You're both welcome. We want all three gunas, but we want them in harmony. And we don't want to be bossed by the gunas. We want to tell the gunas where we want to go. How do you fit into the criteria of my objectives? How can I manipulate circumstances so you are at your greatest position of comfort? I want to put the gunas in harmony and balance. How do I accomplish that? Well, I create an environment conducive to meditation, to worship, to prayer, like the Devi Mandir. And I create, create my body in a position conducive to showing respect so that I can put my body into harmony, and put my breath into harmony, put my mind into harmony and come in to bring my senses inside. 
and bringing the senses inside, I can re arrive at a position of contemplation, of meditation, of total absorption. And that's how we will pursue uh, 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 making a harmony for all three qualities, all three gunas, all three doors, in all three bodies, in the gross body, the subtle body, and the causal body. Not just sattva. Sattva can show you the way home, but it can't enter into the house. One more question, please. A question from James. Namaste, James! So as you say, Krishna lives in duality with Radha, is that part of a lila or opportunity for all of us as a form to demonstrate expressions of love? Absolutely. Absolutely. She lives in Vrindavan. And Brinda is delight. And Bon is the forest. And in the forest of delight is the love affair between Radha and Krishna. Ra is the subtle body and A is consciousness and Da is the support. The support of the subtle body of consciousness is Radha. And Radhe Radhe, Vrindavan Dam, Bolo Sham. In the town of Vrindavan, in the holy pilgrimage place of Vrindavan, sing the praise, Bolo Radhe Sham. The, the, to Radha, she who supports the subtle body of consciousness and to Sham, the dark one, who is unknowable. He's the color of the sky, which is infinite in nature. You can't measure the ends of the, the, the doer of all. Kree, he does. Krishna, he does the Isha, the desired, the, the, the desired uh, effect. He is the performer of all desired effects, is Krishna, the doer of all. So the, the supporter of the subtle body of consciousness is having this romance with the doer of all. And they're dancing in the forest, in the bon, in the forest of delight. Just like all of our others and all of our Krishnas are dancing here in this forest of delight. Om Sam Sarasvati Namaha Namaste.